Campers, backpackers, and park rangers, what is the weirdest or creepiest thing you found while in the woods? Story 1. When I was a teenager, my dad took my brother and I on a week-long canoeing, hiking, and camping trip to a series of lakes that were only accessible by trail or float plane. We launched at 5 a.m. and paddled for four hours until reaching the trailhead. Then we packed our bags into the first lake, dropped them there, and returned for our canoe. It was probably noon by the time we started paddling across, and it took a couple more hours to make it to the other end where the trailhead to the second lake was. By now, we were tired and sore. There wasn't any good spot for a campsite at the second trailhead, so while weary, we decided to press on to the second lake and find a spot there. We were running low on water, but weren't worried about it as there was an old sign at the trailhead that said there was a spring a few kilometers up the trail. As we hiked on, we would periodically see signs posted to trees, advertising the ever-decreasing distance to the sought-after and pleasantly named Silver Spring. About an hour after we had left the lake, we found a sign with an arrow pointing off into the bushes, directing us towards the water source. We left our packs and carried our canteens off into the forest. A few short minutes later we saw a final sign with an arrow pointing to a spot just behind an outcropping of rocks. We eagerly rounded the outcropping and stood there, stunned, dry mouths agape at the sight of a giant, freaking, silver, painted metal spring with a sign above declaring Silver Spring with an arrow pointing down at it. Keep in mind that this was literally in the middle of nowhere, a full and hard day's travel. Whoever lugged that son of a freaking thing in there and made signs and arrows to match. My hat goes off to you, my friend. I hope you had a good laugh. Jerk. Shakes fist at the sky. Dad! It is a dad joke. It sort of reminds me of like Muppet Movie where they say turn left at the fork in the road. Big giant fork in the road. The effort that goes into it, you know. And this is why ChatGPT will never replace actual human work. Story 2. I grew up with a very outdoorsy family. We always went camping and hiking in the summer. I grew up outside. My mother told this story to my sister and I about a time she went camping with my dad before we were born. I was in my tent, and it was the middle of the night, perhaps 1 a.m., and I had woken up to go pee, just like normal. I was about to unzip the tent when I heard a small scratching sound. I paused. It was a slow, deliberate, crunchy, digging kind of sound. It was too rhythmic for an animal. So after making sure it wasn't your father who was sharing the tent, I unzipped a corner of the door and peeked out. The moon was just bright enough for me to see a young woman squatting right next to our little two-man tent, digging at the ground with her bare hands. Even your father was scared. So he went and shined a flashlight on her and told her to go back to wherever she had made camp. The woman got up silently, leaving a four-inch deep hole next to the tent and started walking away. I went outside, went pee, and got back into my sleeping bag. A few minutes later, I was awoken by a clattering sound of a person or animal walking around where we had to put our stuff. I looked outside again, and the woman was crouched low, walking around our stuff and looking at things the way a monkey might. Your father stepped out of the tent, shined the flashlight on her again, and she faced him. He asked her to kindly leave their stuff alone, but she just stood there, dirty and neglected-looking, but clearly not malnourished, staring at his light. He gave up and went back into our tent. Soon... We heard her digging again at her little hole, which was literally six inches and two pieces of thin nylon from my head. I shouted for her to go away, and she ran away in an animalistic kind of way and never returned. I fell back asleep, and in the morning, our stuff was scattered, but nothing was stolen. The End Well, Walter White crystal heads love digging. Don't know what it is about it, but apparently it's fun as hell to smoke Walter White crystals and then dig holes. There's an area here in central Texas famous for being a go-to location for Walter Whiteheads to go and spend the entire weekend digging for arrowheads until the cops show up and search them. 
I was not thinking that when I was reading this story at all. I was thinking it was just someone who was just raised by animals or something like that. I guess either way could be the truth. Which one do you think it was? Do you think it was something paranormal or creepy or illicit substances involved? Story 3. I was geocaching once, and I was just wandering through the woods. I came across a small patch of trees that had Mr. Potato Head faces nailed to them. I was 15 kims from civilization and nowhere near a trail as the cache was deep in the woods. I contacted the cache owner, and he swore they weren't there when he put the cache together, and it was his private land, so nobody should have put it there. The other instance of weirdness was when I was hitchhiking and decided to set up camp off in the woods not far from the highway, had a fire, ate, and set up my little tent. Fell asleep without a problem. Woke up in the middle of the night to some heavy breathing outside my tent. I listened for a bit, scared smegless, and then some movement, and the sound was gone. Woke up the next morning, and there was a photo of a family stuck with a nail to the tree right beside my tent and fresh footprints in the dirt. Being the idiot that I am, I followed the path of the footprints a kilometer or so back into the woods where it ended at a road. Across the street was an abandoned house, and while checking out the house for anything useful, I found several other photos of the people from the photo, individual headshots, and notes apologizing for not protecting them, or not being there for them. I got a feeling like I wasn't alone and decided to make an exit, and as I came out of the house, there was a pickup truck in the road watching me leave. He offered me a ride back to the highway and some food and drink and told me all about the family that lived there and how they all passed away. I never visited the area again. It was near the border of Montana slash Alberta, and I have since moved far, far away. This is actually kind of sweet in the worst possible way. Some dude probably felt that those people deserve to be remembered. Of course, the decision to perform this requiem by terrorizing random campers is questionable, but still sort of sweet. This sounds like a movie, really. I mean, it just sounds like the story of someone who is just really tortured by a past incident and being alone for so long has just really had time to just dwell and let these incidents fester in his head. I hope he gets help. Jeez. Story 4. I am neither of the things in the title. However, I was in a Firewise program with the county. We'd clear roughly 200 square feet around somebody's house. Anyway, we were clearing brush around an elderly man's home, and he suggested over and over that this one area was of no threat and to just skip it. Well, we can't just skip it. That'd leave a weak spot, so we had no choice. After getting almost all of it clear, there was a bit of ladder fuel in one area. We used a bladed weed eater to do this kind of thing. After getting almost the entire 10 to 15 square foot patch cleared, I could not knock down this one patch to ground level. Dented my blades, and I was confused. Realized I was hitting a metal bar, so I dug around and realized it was a refrigerator buried so deep only the door handle stuck out after I knocked off the dirt. After finding this, I alerted my coworker slash friend. By the way, we never found anything like this. Usually it's just trees and bushes and shrubs, etc. So he comes up, and we play the No You Open It game. After about five minutes, curiosity gets the best of me and I open it. But it's jammed. So I start reaming on it and he helps me and it kind of screeches a little bit. It smelled like nothing I've ever encountered. The most horrid stench. We back up like 30 feet and it doesn't help. So I walk up and open it all the way. The smell made my eyes water and regret having a nose. My mouth was open a little bit, and I could taste that foul stench. I figure, what the hell, the worst already happened. I peek inside, and it's a random assortment of bones. I can't tell if animal, because there were no horns or skulls, just random fragments and ribs and long bones like the ones in an animal leg, I could only assume. So we mention this to our boss, and he says he'll add it in his report. A couple weeks later... 
it becomes a, I don't know the word, area of interest, I guess. Apparently another service had to investigate it. However, since this was the very last of the entire area to be cleared once we left that day of finding it, nobody went back until that service crew arrived a month later only to find a large hole where the fridge was. The homeowner denies there ever being anything there at all, just a hole in his land. I still don't know what I stumbled upon. This story wins. Story 5. About 25 years ago, I went hiking in Fossil Falls, just outside of Ridgecrest, California, with some friends. Once we hike down the falls, we get into the opening of the canyon and start smelling what smells like something unalive. As we walk on, the smell gets stronger. We decide to find out what it is. We come upon an area where the smell is just overpowering. On the surface of the ground in this area, there appears to be a couple oil slicks pulled at the top of the surface of the ground, which appears to have been recently dug. We attempt to dig down about six inches, but the smell is just beyond anything we can deal with. We decide to leave and call the cops. The cop gets down into the canyon part of the falls, picks up on the smell, and tells us this isn't a good sign. As we get closer, but not even to the place where the smell is coming from, he starts calling in lots of reinforcements. More cops, helicopters, etc. He told us that for something to generate that kind of smell, someone would have to bury a deer or something of similar mass to make that kind of smell. When we called the cops to follow up on what happened, they told us that it was... Just some chicken skin and bones. No human remains were found. The official story completely conflicted with what the cop, who had previously been a homicide investigator in L.A., had told us. When I told a co-worker what had happened, he reached out to a higher-up that he knew at the Department of Forestry Service, or something like that, and when he relayed the story, was told, How did you find out about this? You shouldn't know about this, and these guys should forget about this immediately. My theory is that someone was unalived and buried on government land. Fossil Falls is U.S. government land, and they didn't want it to get out. There is no way in or out of that canyon unless by military access road from the China Lake Naval Weapons Center. It's possible that they were taking bribes to allow a meat processor to illegally dispose of animal skins. I've seen it done in northwest Pennsylvania, and it's so horrendous to come across that stuff. I've even been stuck behind the truck that hauls them. It's gross as hell. Story 6. Rural Ohio. Quite a few. An old saw. Two-person hacksaw that a tree had literally grown around. It was sticking through the middle of the tree horizontally. Some sort of huge old excavator, like something you might see at a mining operation in the 50s. It had clearly been there for a very long time. I often wonder about the logistics of scrapping it. Lots of old cars. It's fun to snag emblems and stuff from them. Old international pickups, Chevy classics from the 50s, you name it. It's in the Ohio woods somewhere. One of the creepier ones is Cat's Den Road. It's this street actually called Cat's Den, and probably hundreds of stray cats find their way here. Sometimes you can see many of them if you take a trip up the road, and it's especially freaky at night due to the eyes. Nobody seems to know why they chose this area, but it's like the stray cat mecca. The worst one, what we refer to as the tar pits. It's not actual tar, but appears to be some kind of poison that is developed in these very deep mud ruts. When you get into the area, it smells like rotting. Just rotting something. It's not regular mud, more like a hybrid between mud and quicksand. And it has these color tints, greens, probably from leaves, and purples, maybe from wild berries. You avoided this area on the trails, four-wheeling, because it required heavy machinery, wheel loader normally, to get a vehicle or large quad out of this stuff. And this substance didn't occur anywhere else in the woods. I've never seen anything like it. One summer, we saw a bit of a drought, and the biggest of these tar pits finally dried up. Dozens of unalive animal carcasses, deer, rabbits and one or two that could have been foxes, coyotes, or domestic dogs. It was seriously sad. Call us stupid, but some of the local riders borrowed an excavator and buried the bones, all that was left, in a large grave elsewhere. That stuff is still there. It's some kind of natural formation, I guess. 
but none of us are smart enough to figure out what causes it in that one area and nowhere else that any of us have ever seen. That tar pit, as you call it, could be an old wetland that was buried. Something about sulfur causing the smells and it never solidified and reminded me of loose soil and mush. Actually, if you wait another 10,000 years, it'll be an oil reserve. I'm sorry, ooze that's green and purple? It sounds like the stuff that would turn somebody into a mutant or a superhero if you accidentally fell into it or something. Now, as far as like that cat mecca, there's always the theory that you can choose a dog as a pet, but cats choose you. I would bet real money that that's where those cats originate, and they just sort of migrate out to where they're kind of called to go. Story 7 was on a two-week canoe camping trip in a really remote part of Canada. Most days, we would only see one or two other people. Some days, we didn't see anyone. Set up camp on the shore of a big lake and started settling in, when suddenly we heard someone yelling, Bear! Bear! It sounded like a girl's voice. It was bear country, so we all grabbed buckets and started making noise to scare it away. Then suddenly, out of the woods comes this young kid. He couldn't have been more than eight years old. Turns out he was actually yelling, help, I'm scared. There was no bear. He had been riding his bike and somehow wound up in the woods on the other side of the lake, at least a mile from his parents. He was totally lost and starting to lose it. We took him via canoe back to his parents, who were relieved to say the least. Years later, it's still hard to believe that this happened. Good thing you found him instead of someone or something else. Story 8. Once I was on a high school trip in the Netherlands. And after we did some activities during the day, we ended the day by playing a game of Live Stratego in the woods next to the farm where we slept. For the people that don't know what Live Stratego is, it's a live version of a board game where soldiers attack each other without knowing what rank, which determines who will win, the other has. And by memory, try to remember who's got which rank. In the live variation, you had to tag and ask people what rank they were to battle and flee or chase the other if you knew his rank would win or lose from you. So after about an hour of playing this game, at night, in near darkness, I was chased by another guy but managed to lose him. Then I proceeded to walk into a random direction till I reached the edge of the forest. At the edge were a couple of trees where three people were crouching down, staring into one direction. As I wasn't wearing glasses, and I have three, I couldn't see that they weren't children but men from around 25 to 30 years old. When I crouched next to them and asked one of them what rank he was, he angrily hissed at me to go away and leave quickly. I don't know what the heck these guys were doing there, but I ran away as fast as I could. I'm enjoying the image of a group of people disposing of a body and a kid randomly coming in and asking what rank they are. Story 9 I was a bit lost one night and driving slowly on an oil lease road in West Texas, when I saw a mangy coyote walk across the road on its hind legs. It stopped for a moment in the middle of the road and stared at me. The way my headlights glinted in its eyes still gives me the jeebies on occasion. I nearly obeyed my gut instinct to gun it and run the thing over before it gimped on into the dark. I guess it was sick? High fever causing it to act freaky as hell? I don't know. Reminds me of a legend I read once about spirits in the southwest possessing animal carcasses to hunt down trespassers on sacred land. You were supposed to be able to tell one by the fact that it was walking around on two legs, and if you saw one, you were supposed to run like hell. This is the first story in this one I classify as spooky. If there was an animal that was that really freaky looking, yes, I would start to abandon logic. I would not say, wow, that thing looks really sick. I would think, wow, I need to run away from this possessed demon coyote. Story 10. This is not my story. It's my brother's. But it's one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard. And since I haven't seen him post in here, I'm adding it. My brother, Jay, was part of the orienteering team in high school. For those who don't know, orienteering is when they put you in the middle of nowhere in teams of two, give you a map and a compass, and you must find your way to each check-in station in order. And it's a race. So my brother and his partner set out make it through the first few checkpoints and are feeling pretty solid. But they don't make it to the next one when they think they're supposed to. They double-check the map, do some math, and figure out that they miscalculated some angle or another, 
and are now almost off the edge of the map. They recalculate and set off in a new direction. Keep in mind, this line was never intended to be part of the orienteering run. This is unexplored territory, and they come across what my brother said could only be described as a crater, a deep bowl in the forest, devoid of trees. At the center of it was an ambulance. They are in the woods, miles upon miles from any roads, and there is an ambulance that looks like it's decades old sitting in a crater. So, being teenage boys, they go to investigate it. Forget the race. My brother said that the forest was well on its way to reclaiming the vehicle, that it was rusted and covered in plant life. It looked out of date, like it came from the 40s or some bygone era. In the back, the gurney was still there, but bent in the middle, like something had smashed it. There were brown smears on the walls that could have been rust or dirt or excrement or old blood. They both got a horrible feeling from the place and took off out of there. My brother thinks he could probably find it again, but flat out refuses to. Story 11. Had been out stargazing and was sleeping out in a park near town. No tent, just a sleeping bag and pad. This was a fairly popular area for joggers, walkers, etc. I'd found a nice spot in a field a few hundred meters from the top, obscured by tall grass and brush, but with a nice view of the valley below and mountains in the distance. It was very nice. Saw some shooting stars, heard coyotes singing in the distance, and slept very well since it was a warm summer night. In the morning, at the crack of dawn, I was woken up by one of the strangest performances I've ever witnessed. Above me on the hill, I could hear some kind of chanting. Due to my concealed location, I couldn't actually see what was going on, and I wasn't keen on moving to a better vantage point lest I be seen by the group. A man's loud and deep voice was half chanting, half shouting in a language I couldn't identify. It sounded like a Latin-derived language, and was definitely not Spanish, although he kept repeating a word which sounded similar to Diablo, Spanish for the devil. There were other voices, too, but he was clearly leading whatever was happening up there. Eventually, he finished his chant-slash-shout. There were some cheers and whoops, and then the entire group silently departed. After waiting a while to make sure it was clear, I went up to where the sound had come from. There was no physical evidence of whatever had happened. I asked everybody I knew in town if they had any idea what it might have possibly been, and nobody had heard anything like it. To this day, one of my greatest regrets is not peeking out of my hiding spot to see what the heck was going on. Probably your local coven holding holiday worship. Nothing too sinister. Story 12. Not necessarily creepy but certainly unfortunate. My friends and I went winter camping in the middle of a large park, at the end of a five-mile dirt road. Of course, there weren't many people out there. On our last evening at the park, we took a short hike to an outcrop that looked over the valley. On our way back to the road, we crossed paths with a kid, mid-late twenties. We thought nothing of it, said hello, and drove into town to eat some dinner. Well, we were camping right across the road from this outcrop, so when we got back to the end of the dirt road, there were about 20 volunteer search and rescue cars all around near our campsite. One of the volunteers approached us and asked about a kid who fell from the 200-foot outcrop. Sure enough, he matched the description of the kid we crossed paths with. We were quite freaked. We went back to our campsite, drank some beer, and continued feeling uncomfortable. It didn't help that we heard the search and rescuers hollering in the valley, seemingly from all directions about every 10 minutes. We continued to drink. At about 1 a.m., as we were getting ready to pass out, we heard this gut-wrenching scream slash cry slash awful noise. It was the kid's mother. They found his body. The screaming went on for what felt like an hour, but was probably more like ten minutes. No sleep was had that night. During another trip out there, we saw a deer that had fallen from a different cliff. The thing was all over the place, with its head facing the trail. Story 13 I am a biologist, although I used to be an archaeologist. For the past few years, I've spent a considerable amount of time living in really remote areas, ranging from a good chunk of the U.S., Montana all the way down to New Mexico as well as from Maine to New Jersey, Europe, and primarily Africa. I absolutely love these kind of posts, although there are a few things that have made me scratch my head and or feel a bit uncomfortable. This is despite the fact that my old career used to involve excavating and surveying historic and prehistoric things, 
And my new one involves looking for leopard expirations. Not unalive leopards, but their prey. One, a bag full of Super Nintendo cartridges. Two, a bag full of blurry photos of people. Apparently, people have stumbled upon this before. Three, random plane parts, including a wing. Four, a human tooth. Five, numerous old cemeteries. Six, numerous old abandoned shacks that are truly in the middle of nowhere. Seven, an old Walter White crystal lab, apparently. Eight, and for me, the weirdest was an old Volkswagen van in the middle of the desert that had bones, animal remains, and old Playboy magazines in it. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 14. I used to live in the middle of BFE, Ohio, in a very small town. One cold January morning, this was during the deep breeze, I was out front making breakfast on the fire, and I noticed something fall down at a 45-degree angle into the brush just across a clearing. I drove over it and checked it out. It's a homemade UAV, bigger than you'd find for sale. It was fixed wing. You can tell it's not military, but it's painted gray and has a camera in it. Can't find any marking to see who to return it to, but there is a Raspberry Pi controlling the thing, and a battery, like a marine battery, only just for the controller, and a battery for the motor. The most notable feature was a solar panel array on top of the UAV. I know a guy who does data recovery at his job, and I asked him if he would take a look. He comes over and hooks the Pi up to his laptop. After a while, he shows me an autopilot program and the file of the video it took. We see some people, but not enough to make anything out. The autopilot program had a map of the course, beginning in western Virginia near Harrisonburg, and the end was somewhere in Illinois, literally an empty field near a town called Rantoul. So I called JMU's engineering school and asked if they sent it out. No dice. They say that no one was working on drones. I dropped it off at the police station in town, explained what happened, and left it at that. Story 15. Camping in Australia, the middle of nowhere up past Willuna in Western Australia. It's just you, your fellow campmates, and kilometers and kilometers of empty bushland. Oh, and sheep and kangaroo and flies. Oh, deity, the flies. We camped at the base of a small range of hills. Spent the evening climbing up, down, and all over them with our friend's kids. Lots of exploring to do. Mate tells me he feels like we're being watched. My response was, yeah, right, who'd want to be this far out? During the night, we hear scratching on the tent and knocking on the caravan walls. Then the sound of something jiggling the handle to each door on the caravan and thumping around the cars as well now. By now, the entire camp is awake and freaking out, but no one was brave enough to get out of their tents or the caravan. We could also hear loud footsteps and huffing and puffing. Get up the next morning, and there is a huge freaking bull in the middle of our camp using pretty much anything it can to scratch itself on. Few trees equal no real areas to scratch himself, obviously. So we chased the bull off, and then discovered the huge freaking footprints, human-shaped, going around our camp. I've got size 9 ladies, and these things were massive. Everyone sort of looked at each other, packed up as fast as we could, and noped the heck out of there. Story 16 Backpacking in the Beartooth Wilderness in the early 2000s with a good friend of mine. Three days into the hike, we had only seen one other couple. On the third night, at about 4 a.m., we were awoken in our tent to what sounded like screams in the forest. Big, guttural screams. Obviously, we were freaked out sitting in the tent, not knowing what was out there. We started hearing what sounded like hail for about 15 minutes, followed by heavy footsteps near our camp. My friend and I started yelling and making tons of noise, a trick to fend off bears, and the commotion outside the tent slowly came to a halt. In the morning, after not sleeping at all, we unzipped the tent to the creepiest scene. All around the tent were pebbles, the hail, literally thousands of little pebbles that were not there the evening before, Surrounding the tent in a near-perfect circle were 20 or so 150 to 300-pound boulders. My friend and I noped out of there, making a three-day hike into a one, practically running the entire way to the car. Too long didn't read? Bigfoot gave us a visit, then dropped rocks and pebbles all over our tent. Oh, what the hell? I'm not sure why, but this one creeped me out the most. Story 17 
I was up in the Blue Ridge Mountains doing some fall colors viewing a couple of years ago. Pulled over to the side of the road to answer the call of nature, beside some big rocks with an obvious path going around behind them. I went around the rock and found what appeared to be a hobo camp or something. There was an open space with a fire pit made of flat stones in the middle, and sections of logs to sit on all around it. It was full of trash, like empty beanie weenie cans and empty chips bags, and there were the little piles of toilet paper further back down the trail that many hikers and campers are familiar with. The creepy thing was the partial skeleton of something that, from its position, looked like it had been in the fire. There was most of a spine, most of a rib cage, and a skull. It looked like a dog to me, but I am by no means an expert. I had only noticed the skeleton after I had gone about my business. I walked over and leaned over it to get a better look, and felt heat still coming off of the remains of a fire. That freaked me out, and I got the feeling I was being watched, so I vomited. Story 18. On the home stretch of the PCT, north of the last highway crossing in Washington, my group ran into this old lady who was ridiculously unprepared. She had a giant pack that she could barely manage, plus two grocery bags filled with silly stuff and bad backpacking food. She was also unaware that she had entered a short, like ten miles or so, waterless section, and she was not making it to the next source. She also didn't speak good English, and no one figured out what the hell she was thinking. Most older people are experienced. She obviously was not. I'm also tripping on shrooms while all this happens. Someone hiked all her stuff to camp, and she barely made it without any weight. Several of us had to give her our water, which was uncomfortable, but not big. She was told to get off at Hart's Pass. Just very strange that she'd be there. Maybe she was hopping the border. I absolutely hate running into people when I used to trip on shrooms in the woods. It was always some sort of weird drama, just like what you describe. Story 19 I'm not sure if this counts or not, because it most likely was nothing and wasn't creepy at the time, but here goes. When I was 13... Me and my uncle were camping and we came across some discarded toys that would have belonged to a little girl. We were very deep in the forest and my uncle pointed the toys out to me as being very out of place. Many years later, I wikipedia the place and read that a young girl was once kidnapped from near there and she was found 20 miles from where the toys were. Most likely, it was just some random toys that fell out from some backpack. But once I read that, I called my uncle and we were freaked out for days. It would seriously disturb me to find toys deep in the woods. Nope. No thanks. Creepy as heck. Story 20. Doing a group trip in the woods. Literally 40 minutes from any town. We ask our group leader if we can go back to our cabin as night rolls around. He says, sure, and we begin to walk. We have to walk through a path that's 10 minutes long and in the middle of a thick forest. When we're halfway to our cabin, I get an uneasy feeling. I turn around, and literally ten feet behind us is this random guy in a yellow poncho following us. I tell my friends, we all turn around, none of us recognize him. The guy in the poncho just smiles at us for a second, and then runs off the path into the woods. So my friends and I sprint to the cabin and enter. The rest of the group is already there. We tell the group leader there about it. He calls the other leaders, and they start looking around. They didn't find anything but a new rule was put in place that required someone to be with a leader at all times when you're outside of your cabin. Smart of the leaders to figure out how to keep you all corralled at night. Story 21. Not creepy, just unusual and weird. I was hiking with my dad in the mountainous area behind Germany and Czech Republic one day a couple years ago, and we were on the highest point of our trek, on a small trail with an overhang nearby on the left side, but both sides of the trail were surrounded by small shrubbery. We were walking in silence, and I looked up, and farther down the trail was an animal that quickly dashed to the side as I looked up. This sounds weird, but the animal was white, with a huge long tail, and the body of a large fox. It looked exactly like the Pokemon Nine Tails, just white as snow. Story 22 I used to work at a park in Arizona a few years ago. I was in charge of collecting camping fees and cleaning the sites when the campers left. I didn't work alone, but on this day my partner called in and I was left with another ranger who just checked in every six hours. While I was cleaning, I noticed someone was staying at the lot at the very end. 
As I would have normally done, I went over and introduced myself and told him I needed to collect the fee and stuff. He told me he was waiting for his brother to come back with his truck, so I said, all right, and left. When I came back 30 minutes later, he left all his stuff there and left a plastic bag on the picnic table. Normally, I wouldn't go through his stuff, but the bag had a horrible rotting stench. I was going to throw it away so animals don't come when the bag rips open from the side and a bunch of meat falls out. Inside the meat, there were human teeth and fingernails. I called the police immediately, and I really didn't stay to find out about it since I had to leave the state for school. Story 23 my friend and I were hiking a section of the Appalachian Trail when we came across a small stream with a woman staring into it, muttering to herself and kind of shaking. My friend and I paused and looked at each other, then continued past her and tried to acknowledge her with a hello to see if she was okay. She pretended like we didn't even exist. We continued on, talking about how it was weird when about two miles later, we came across three officials. I don't remember what organization they represented two of which were carrying assault rifles and the other a bag of white powder and a handgun. They were wearing black assault vests and combat boots and just nodded at my friend and I like nothing unusual was happening. You just stumbled across a wild Walter White crystal head. They're not uncommon in Appalachia. Story 24. Not quite what you're asking for, but close enough, I suppose. Me and a buddy were walking home along the river when we noticed a tipped-over canoe on the bank. We tried to pull it out, but it was too heavy, so I got in the water to push from underneath. One step forward, and the ground just disappeared. I was instantly sucked under, dragged and tossed around the bottom a bit, then spit back out and sucked right back under. A couple of days, it was on the news that an old couple had tipped over and passed away. I had almost expired by the same undertow that had unalived them in trying to retrieve their canoe. This happened over and over for what felt like an eternity until I was able to grab a branch my buddy was holding out for me. Story 25 I was trekking deep woods behind my in-law's place one spring with my wife. We came across a small, seemingly abandoned cabin surrounded by a three-foot-high barbed wire fence. There were axes, picks, and shovels inside the fence, knives and buttloads of camo inside the cabin. The next month or so after, we noticed people in our area started reporting garages and sheds being broken into and tools going missing. They found the mofo who was doing the B&Es. He escaped from a mental institution and said he was living in an abandoned cabin preparing for who knows what. I was freaking rooting around in this crazy man's cabin probably while he was watching my wife and I. Story 26 Once while hiking with some friends, we came across a noose that looked like it had been hanging there for a while. It was probably a prank, but we were all a bit tense after that. My brother found a noose in the forest once when he was about nine. Pretty sure it wasn't a prank since there was a dude in it. Now I'm tempted to Google the place and time, but it's a bit late for creeping myself the hell out before sleeping. Story 27. Hiking in the Wichita Mountains NWR nine years ago in the winter. Found a teenage kid who had shot himself through the right eye with a 32 caliber handgun at the base of a fire tower. So I have that image in my memory for the rest of my life. For about an hour, was a suspect in an unaliving investigation until the county sheriffs could properly ascertain a cause of death. That is horrifying. I'm so sorry. Story 28. Well, the sound a cougar makes was about the most terrifying thing in the world until my mother explained it was a big cat, not a woman getting unalived off in the woods. Foxes sound like that. Like a woman screaming? They sometimes keep us awake at night shrieking. Story 29. The sound of wolves slash mountain lions in the middle of nowhere is absolutely haunting. Sounds like a banshee. I've been stalked by mountain lions just outside the light of the fire on an Indian reservation. Really chilling knowing something's there watching you. A dude walked and rummaged through our campsite once. We just waited him out in our tent. He eventually left. Didn't steal anything that we could see. Story 30. I was backpacking at Philmont Scout Ranch a couple of years ago. In the middle of the night, one of the rangers, guides, showed up to our camp screaming and yelling for help. Turns out he had no recollection that he was lost, only that something was following him, probably a mountain lion. We found the search party really quick, and it turns out he had been missing for around a day. 
They went back to check for mountain lion tracks and found his boot prints along with bare footprints and handprints. Holy hell, that's scary. Story 31. A dog's skin removed completely intact, large chains with plates for bolting them to the ground attached to the paws. On the other side of the path, all of the dog's organs were neatly arranged in a stack. No bones, no blood. I walked by it nearly every day until it rotted away to something indistinguishable from other desert detritus, except the chains years later. No one ever disturbed it. Maggots never ate it. I made up all kinds of stories for it in my head. But I'll never know anything except that dog perished hard. Story 32 Backpacking on Shasta, we had our camping spot late so we only had time to set up, eat, and go to bed. In the morning, we can finally look around, and right by our tent, in the rock outcropping, a very nice box is wedged in containing someone's remains. Also on that trip, after about seven hours of hiking up Shasta, we see a man walking down in a suit, dress shoes, and carrying a briefcase. Shasta can be a weird and mysterious place. Story 33 some friends and I were doing some hallucinogens in the woods somewhere in Montana. We hear some noises in the woods and freak out a bit. We know we're all high and try to laugh it off, assuming that we're hearing things that aren't there. A few minutes later, a freaking bear comes out of the woods. We all panic and book it for the car. This thing isn't frightened at all and books it after us. We manage to get into the car before the beast catches up to us. A few of us are crying at this point. Long story short, it wasn't a bear. It was a dog. Story 34. Woke up in the morning and walked out of the tent to find a sheep ripped apart and scattered across a 20-foot area, about 10 feet from our campsite. The creepy part is, this was in the Mourne Mountains in Northern Ireland. There aren't any wild predators there bigger than a fox. Certainly nothing big enough to tear a sheep to shreds. Story 35 was backpacking with a group of people on a short weekend backpacking trip. Found a foam head with the mouth carved out, almost as if it had been used for unspeakable things. The worst part was that younger members of our group insisted on keeping it and using it as a mascot for when we went to Philmont, a scout camp in New Mexico. It was gross. Story 36 I used to go backpacking on the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina every few years with a buddy of mine. I went peacefully asleep one night laying on the ground beside the fire in a sleeping bag. I had a dream that my chest was being compressed by something. Woke up to a raccoon standing on my chest staring me right in the eyes. The panic scared him as bad as me and I never saw him again and went right back to sleep. Story 37 A human skull and some random bones wrapped in a blanket. Must have been where someone dumped a body. Alerted the authorities and got the frack out of those woods. So you're the hiker who always finds the bones of a missing person. Story 38. In Georgia, I unknowingly walked into an abandoned cemetery for children. It was overgrown with weeds and bushes, and I nearly tripped over some tiny headstones from the 1800s. There are no signs or anything anywhere, just a lot of graves that you can't quite make out until you're walking on top of them. Story 39 One time I was on a field trip with my class, and one of the girls went to pee a bit far from the trail. In a small tree, she found an unalived man hanged from his neck, his legs cut, his face masked with a sack, and his intestines spread throughout the nearby area. It was about two weeks old. Police were called, and a few of the students contributed to the investigation. Story 40. Skinned cow carcass. Not really that creepy, but it startles you when you almost step on it. The cow's head was nailed to a tree, and it was decayed. Pretty much just the skull left. Underneath the head was a pink plastic chair, child-sized. A giant pair of purple underwear. Story 41. A tray of surgical tools sitting on a stump. All aboard the nope train. Story 42. Big toe. Just on the ground. Nothing else. Just a severed toe. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.